Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Lynn. <laughs> Thank you, Arthur. Thank you, Arthur. That's all I have to do for Arthur. He's so easy. My name is Lynn Ransom. I'm the curator of programs at the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies. And on behalf of Penn Libraries and the Schoenberg Institute, I'd like to welcome everyone to tonight's Schoenberg Institute and the Herbert D. Katz Center Distinguished Fellow, Fellows Lecture in Jewish Manuscript Studies. The Sims Katz Fellowship, to use a shorter name, is the result of a very happy and a fruitful collaboration now in its fifth year between the two centers. Each year, just to give you a word about the fellowship, we pair a distinguished scholar in Jewish studies with a manuscript or group of manuscripts in our collections. The result, we hope, is an enriched understanding <coughs> excuse me, of the significance of the manuscript or the group of manuscripts to Jewish studies and an opportunity for us to gain new insights into these unique artifacts of our shared intellectual and cultural heritage. This evening's lecture, <clears throat> excuse me, I have an allergy attack or something, <clears throat> is funded in part by, David, by the David B. Ruderman Visiting Scholar Fund and sponsored by the Jewish Studies Program. Uh, it will be presented by the 2019-2020 SimsCats Fellow, Profiz Professor Fabrizio Lely, uh, for the University of Salento in Italy. We know that you will enjoy his lecture tonight as much as we have enjoyed hosting him. As many of you already know, he and his family, Flora and Simone, if Simone could stand up and wave hello, <laughs> maybe not. He was very, very ready to go and give a lecture tonight himself. Um, but they're delightful guests um, and friends to, to have here. There he goes. <laughs> Grazie, grazie. As organizers of the fellowship, <clears throat> Arthur Kieran, Natalie Dorman, and I would like to give our sincere thanks to the Jewish Studies Program for sponsoring this event, as well as to Constantia Constantinou, the director of Penn Libraries, and Steve Weitzman, the director of the Cat Center, for their continued support of this fellowship. The benefits of such a collaboration extend well beyond tonight's lecture and we are deeply grateful for this opportunity to bring so many of us together tonight. So I'll hand it over to Catherine now to say a few words. Very few words, all right. And then we will get started. Thank you. So I'm Catherine Hellerstein. I'm director of the Jewish Studies Program here at Penn and a professor of Yiddish in the Department of Germanic Languages and Literatures. Um, I'm here to welcome you very briefly to the 5th Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies and Herbert D. Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies Distinguished Fellowship in Jewish Manuscript Studies. Since 2015, which is I think when it started, the Jewish Studies has been happy to sponsor the public lecture and I think we're also sponsoring or co-sponsoring the reception. The money flows out and whatever happens, happens. So afterwards, stick around and eat. I mean Yiddish, S, right? S, S meine Kinder. Um, and I'm thrilled to join the chorus in welcoming Fabrizio Lelli and his family, Flora and Simone, to, as the 2019-2020 Sims Cats Fellow. Good afternoon. Um, my name is David Ruderman, uh, and I teach Jewish history here. Uh, and I was also associated with the Katz Center uh, for uh, many years. Um, this is a, a double simcha for me, if I can use the uh, Latin term. Um, not only am I acquainted with the speaker, who I have much to say about, but I'm very acquainted with the subject of the talk. Um, Abraham Farisol, who lived from 1451, we're not sure when he died, around 1525, 1526, was the subject of my doctoral dissertation. Uh, in fact, it made my career. In fact, I was so involved with Farisol for so many years, my friends used to call me Farisol. Uh, and I pronounce it correctly because uh, uh, Farisol was a cantor and a musician. 
Uh, and one of his manuscripts, he was also one of the most extraordinary prolific scribes of the late Middle Ages. One of his most extraordinary manuscripts has uh, Fa, Re, Sol with the, the, the musical. Cle cle so that's exactly how his name is pronounced. Um, I just want to say a word about, I mean, for me, I mean, the, the moment of, of having Lely come and talk about Fari Sol, I published uh, my dissertation. My dissertation was in Hebrew at the Hebrew University. Uh, and then I published it in English in 1981. So we are be basically speaking about 40 years later, which is really quite amazing to come and to discover, first of all, that Arthur Quiron has acquired a manuscript that I did not know about. I had read every manuscript that I could find of Farisol in, 19, in the 1970s. Um, but to discover that uh, Farisol ends up with me at Penn uh, and that Lely is coming to speak about, uh, you can understand what an extraordinary coincidence this is. Let me tell you how I found Fari Soul and what it meant to me at the time. And I'll do this very, very briefly. I know you want to hear the speaker and not me. But uh, they knew when they invited me, I couldn't help but say a word or two about both subjects. Um, I was a young student at the Hebrew University, uh, and I was looking for a professor. And uh, there were really two. Both of them were very different. One was Chaim Hillel Ben Sasson. Uh, both, uh, he is, of course, gone many years, uh, and uh, Chaim Beinart. They hated each other. In fact, they wouldn't sign my dissertation because Chaim Hillel Ben Sasson had an argument with, uh, with Chaim Beinart. Uh, not over me, but over in general. Uh, this was the Hebrew University of uh, the 1970s. Um, but nevertheless, one day I heard in a lecture, that a graduate seminar that uh, Ben Sasson, a very scary man, was giving about the economic views of, of a man named Abraham Farisol. From his polemic with Christianity, a work called Magain Avraham, uh, and that really, wow, that was fascinating, uh, a kind of proto-capitalistic views of the world and an argument about uh, in defense of usury. Um, and then uh, I met Chaim Beinart in New York the year after he was visiting, and he said, why don't you work on the author of the first Hebrew geography of the New World? And when I discovered that they were indeed the same person, I knew I had found something to write about. Uh, as a young man, I was always seeking opportunities to connect my own Jewish identity with the outside world. I was a major in the Renaissance as an undergraduate. And therefore, my question was, um, where are the Jews in the Renaissance? Like Joan Kelly would ask, where are women? Are there women in the Renaissance? Uh, and that began, for me, a search. Uh, there had been, of course, works written before this, but no one had really framed the, the, the subject exactly in the way I wanted to do it. And therefore, Fari Sol became, for me, a vehicle uh, for exploring through a detailed biography of a, such a prolific uh, author uh, the opportunity of really asking the larger questions about Renaissance and Jewish culture uh, at the end of the 15th and early 16th century. So that's my Farisol part. I could go on, but I'm not lecturing on Farisol tonight. Uh, Professor Lely is. Now a word about Lely. I'm going to read, first of all, from his bio on his uh, internet site. Fabrizio Lely is associate professor of Hebrew language and literature at the University of Salento in Lecce, Italy. Uh, his research focuses on the philosophical and mystical literature of late medieval and early modern Italian Jewish authors and on the intellectual relations between Jews and Christian scholars in the Italian Renaissance. Now, that's all accurate, but it's much too modest. Here's the way I would put it. Um, Professor Lely is the foremost authority on Jewish-Christian interchange in Renaissance Italy. There is no one that is doing more work. Uh, one of the most extraordinary things about Fabrizio, and I know him quite well, is that uh, he um, grew up uh, learning uh, as a child, uh, Simona's age, uh, uh, reading Latin, uh, uh, Greek, and Hebrew. Uh, the three pillars of our civilization, of our Western civilization, forgive me. Um, and clearly, as a true scholar who got this from the home, he brought this to bear in his work on the Renaissance. Uh, I made my career through Farisol. He made his career through Yohanan uh, Alimano, the primary teacher of Pico della Mirandola and the Florentine circle of Neoplatonists uh, at the end of the 15th century. His work is extremely important. His also his a book on Genizano. I could go on and list all the different writings that he has written and the many articles and the many edited books. 
Um, what I must uh, promote is a book that just came out from the University of Pennsylvania Press called Connecting Histories. It was uh, produced as a result of, uh, my, of our, our last year where I was director. We did a, a year on early modern jewelry. And there is a brilliant essay in this book by Fabrizio um, on um, P uh, Pietro Aretino and uh, um, um, uh, Eliyahu Khalfan. Um, again, a story about a Jew and uh, a, a very famous uh, Italian philosopher connecting with each other over the mysteries of the Kabbalah. Uh, clearly, therefore, uh, Lely has a very important status within uh, the world of Renaissance studies and the unique status of working with Hebrew as well as Greek and Italian, uh, and, uh, and Latin, of course. Um, one word about uh, Lely and the center. Lely uh, was a fellow at the center I count four times. Uh, I know Steve has got much uh, tighter than, than me in letting people return, but I figured people of Lely's quality, if you can get them, bring them. Uh, so, uh, but he's back again, so that, that's under Steve's watch, not mine, so I think that's, that's uh, unbelievable. Um, one of the most uh, successful uh, ventures for me uh, as the director of the center was a trip I led for donors to Italy. I can't remember which year it was, but it was an extraordinary year. On that trip alone were the entire Katz family, um, uh, the Viterbi family, uh, the Strauss family, uh, what we would call the Amudea Tavech, the pillars of the center until today. I mean, these were the major uh, donors of the center. And boy, did they demand uh, hotels. I remember Phyllis and I scurrying around, uh, you know, making sure their rooms were clean and uh, uh, carrying luggage and everything else. I mean, it was really kind of scary having people of that kind. But the most brilliant thing I did on this trip was to hire uh, Fabrizio as the tour guide for Tuscany. Um, I never, amazing what a tour guide he was. I never met anyone who could identify every obscure work of art in every church in Tuscany. And at the same time, he would sit with all those, the women and men, and show them what wine to drink and how to drink and what food to order. They were so charmed by him, they just took out their checkbooks on the spot, and the center uh, became uh, what it is today. It, it was really an amazing experience to, to share that with him for four or five days in, uh, and to see Tuscany through the eyes of Fabrizio Lelli. I'm getting to the end. Uh, I could go on, but I want to uh, cite one more thing from Lely's website, and then I'm going to close. Here's what he writes about his own relationship to scholarship. The close connection of cultural heritage and the shaping of one's personal identity has always represented the major focus of my intellectual concerns. In other words, we are the fruit of what nourishes us spiritually and rationally the achievement of the learning acquired at home and at school, the result of an ongoing purposeful or fortuitous exchange with other individuals or social groups. Such a declaration not only defines who Lely is as a student of the Renaissance and Judaic learning, but also defines why I personally feel an intimate connection with him in our shared scholarship and in our common human values. Fabrizio Lely. I must be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm about to, <clears throat> to cry. <laughs> I, I, I didn't expect such wonderful words, kind words, and words of uh, sentiment. I don't know what to call them. And I'm very moved, really moved. And I just want to say, uh, to add to what David just said, that and I'm, I'm not saying to, to flatter you or anything, but if I am what I am today, I mostly owe it to David Ruderman because he believed in me when he first met me in London, very long ago in the last century already. <laughs> and uh, he said, why don't you apply for a fellowship at the Katz Center, which in those days was not yet the Katz Center, the Center for Judaic Studies, 
And I said, why should I do that? I'm nobody. I'm no one. Nobody knows me. I'm just a student. Why should I do that? And she pushed me to do so. And I did. And I came to Philadelphia. And I understood, living here, that my life would be totally different than what it was in Italy. And it really changed my life. From that time on, I understood that my life should have been that of a scholar in Judaica, in Jewish studies, or whatever. And again, I owe this to David. I understood who I was, really. And I, it's true, I'm honest. I don't know what to, to say. So it's, I don't think it's a coincidence, as you said, that I'm here. It's destiny, it's whatever. I don't know what, what you want to call it. I, I don't know, I have no words. So first and foremost, it's going to be too long. Um, I want to thank the uh, Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies and the Cat Center for inviting me once more to Philadelphia, where I've been many times. The first time was right 20 years ago, 20 years ago, at exactly this period, in, in this time of the year, I was here for the first time. And uh, I'm, I have to thank all my friends here in this room and uh, all my friends in Philadelphia, all the new, because every time I'm here, I meet new people, I befriend with new people for their support, for their insights, because talking to Arthur, Kiran, I received a lot of insights of what I would be doing on the, with this manuscript, talking to Natalie, I received a lot of insights and advice on what I'm, I would be writing and so on and so forth. And Etty helped me with the presentation. And of course, my family, my wife, my son, who are here with me, they always accompany me. And this is also related somehow, if you want, to the title of this marvelous manuscript, which I'm going to introduce you, Igeret uh, or the, the, the translation is letter on the paths of the world, or on the ways of the world, as you like it better. And uh, my wife and son accompany me always on the paths of the world. So thank you very much for being here. So um, <clears throat> I will be dealing with this manuscript. But before taking, I mean, getting to the manuscript itself, I would like to introduce you to Abraham Farisol, we have here the best specialist in Farisol, David. So please correct me if I'm mistaken. And before getting into Farisol's identity, I would like to sort of create a background for you on the Italian Renaissance, the city of Ferrara especially, where Farisol lived most of his life. So, I don't know which, here, here, here. The Rochelle Miscellany of the Israel Museum in Jerusalem is universally known as the most elegantly and lavishly Hebrew manuscript of the Italian Renaissance. It was planned as a sumptuous work which would encompass in detail almost every custom of religious and secular Jewish life of the Italian region where the wealthy patron lived. Fanciful landscapes, special perspective settings, human and animal representations echo the style of the best artists who worked for the court of the Este family in Ferrara in the third quarter of the 15th century. Indeed, the illuminators of this glorious masterwork may have been associated with the workshop that decorated the famous Latin Bible of Borso d'Este. At the end of the book of Job that the miscellany displays in its entirety, we find a full page miniature, the one on, on the left side, as you can see, that depicts the chief character's initial wealth. Workers within an idyllic rural setting are shown in Job's fertile lands, 
while in the foreground, shepherds are tending jobs flocks. In representing a typical northern Italian countryside, the illuminator also hints at the exotic location of Job's faraway land. In the lower left side of the scene, a dromedary appears with sheep, oxen, and donkeys, thus faithfully following the introductory scenes, uh, the introductory section of the book of Job. And there, indeed, this biblical source was chosen by most Jewish interpreters of the Renaissance as the fundamental for all sort of encyclopedic knowledge. The exotic stones, plants, animals mentioned in the book, as well as the mythical lands where they should be found, could be analyzed by modern interpreters in light of the new geographic and scientific discoveries of the period. One of the many Jewish interpreters of the Book of Job in the Italian Renaissance was Abraham Farisol. He was born in 1452, possibly, probably, in Avignon in southern France, and from his native city he later moved to Italy with his family attracted by the thriving intellectual atmosphere of the peninsula. He lived in the most prestigious centers of early Renaissance Italy, in Mantua, in Florence, and spent most of his time in Ferrara, the wealthy capital of the Estes Dukedom. While in Florence, he took part in the academic life and befriended both Jewish and non-Jewish scholars who lived there. He was well received by the nobility and had the opportunity to meet Lorenzo the Medici himself, whose tolerance toward any religion or confession was worldly known. The same curiosity about nature that appears in the decoration of the Rothschild's miscellany emerged from a personal remark written in Farisol's Igeret or Chotolam. We read in chapter 21 that Camillo parts, I don't know how to pronounce this word, live in the African region of Bondomel that is located in the continent of Ethiopia far from the ocean. And I have seen one of such animals in our days in Florence in the year 245, according to our minor computation. Camillo part was the name given in the 15th century to the animal that we presently call giraffe. In this passage, Farisol reports an event he personally attended, though not in 1485, as he purports, but two years later. On November 18, 1487, a giraffe was sent to Florence as a present for Lorenzo de' Medici from the Sultan of Egypt. Lorenzo's giraffe aroused an incredible curiosity in his days and was portrayed in several paintings. The same fascination with nature and exotic worlds that triggered the exquisite illumination of the Rothschild's job appears in a detail of Domenico Ghirlandaio's fresco painting in Santa Maria Novella Firenze, where the Medici's giraffe appears in the Magi's procession moving from the Far East to worship the newborn Jesus. As we might understand from the title of Farisol's work, or Hotolam, or Ways of the World, the aim of the author was that of setting the important geographic discoveries of his days within a, a religious framework that still had the Bible as the stone upon which to build all human knowledge. For both Jews and Christians, seeing a giraffe from life was tantamount as acknowledging the significance of God's creation as demonstrated by the book of Job. Farisol's treatise was written in Ferrara and completed on the first day, Rosh Chodesh, of the Jewish month of Kislev of the year 285. That corresponds to the end of the year 1524 of Common Era. In those days, the Jewish population of Ferrara numbered around 2,000 souls a big number relative to the total population of the city, which was around 30,000 people. 
the Jewish population of Ferrara had grown dramatically at the turn of the 16th century, reflecting the massive expulsions of Jews from Spain and Portugal and the various waves of migration of thousands of exiles from southern Italy between 1495 and 1510, when the Kingdom of Naples was absorbed into the Spanish territories. The Italian Duke Hercule, or Hercules I and his wife Eleonora welcomed Jewish exiles in their dukedom. In Hercules' lands, Jews were accepted in all trades, were allowed to form taxes, and could own properties. The Duke extended to them a papal permission to practice medicine among Christians. Such excellent conditions continued with Hercules' descendants and attracted in Ferrara new waves of exiles all throughout the Cinquecento. Among them were also crypto-Jews or conversos from Portugal, Jews forced to convert to Catholicism, who often reverted to Judaism after their arrival in Italy. Besides the traditional activities of loan banking, usually run by Italian or Ashkenazi Jewish families, New industries, especially in silk weaving, were established by the Sephardi newcomers who traded with the Iberian Peninsula and the Spanish colonies in the East. Jews, likewise, stimulated the export trade by their transactions with conversos in Flanders and France, in Rome and in Venice. This is, this is why, for all of them, trading routes were very significant and Farisal's treatise, or Chotolam, highlights the relevance of the new routes opened by Portuguese and Spanish explorers of the oceans. Abraham Farisal lived in a very special environment at a period when the Jewish component of the Ferraran society was visible by everybody and everywhere. Jews were present at court, in the streets, and in the markets. There were Jewish artists, especially goldsmiths like Meir da Sessa and his wife who worked for the Duke and for his family. We actually know of at least two portraits by Bartolomeo Veneto, a scarcely studied but excellent Venetian painter that might be associated with Jewish Northern Italian society. One of the two portraits presently belongs to a private collection in Milan. It depicts a lovely young lady in the garb of Jael, the biblical heroine who killed Israel's enemy Sisera by driving a nail into his head. Hammer and nail are clearly visible in the lady's hands. However, if we zoom into the painting, we observe a very significant detail. Under Giles' delicate fingers, a precious ring appears, a jewel that matches the standards of early 16th century Northern Italian jewelry. According to art historians, Giles' tools might actually hint at the profession of the lady that is portrayed. Was she a goldsmith, like Maid Assessor's wife? Even though I'm unsure about this interpretation, I wish to stress another detail that allows us to hold that the portrayed woman was Jewish. The lady dons a very peculiar hat, one that could only be found in Germany and in earlier periods. Is this a hint to a possible Ashkenazi origin of this young woman? The second portrait by Bartolomeo Veneto is now in the Thyssen collection in Madrid. According to recent interpretation, this man should be identified with our Abraham Farisol, even though no evidence supports such identification. However, the gentleman who wears fashionable clothes and a beautiful hat holds in his right hand a mysterious object. In the past, this was identified as a tooth stick. But this would seem rather odd. If we focus, I'm sorry, if we focus on the object, 
we see that it is a very nicely executed piece of jewelry. I don't know if you can see it, but it's really very fine, very beautiful. That has a small hand at its bottom. It's, it's this a sort of hanging hand. Was this a Torah pointer, a yad? A tool that would immediately identify the profession of the painted man? It is well known that Farisol was a renowned sofer, a scribe of Hebrew biblical and liturgical texts, and a cantor that worked for the Ferraran congregation. I think that the object could be actually a headpin in the shape of a pointer. For a non-Jewish viewer, this appears as a sign of distinction. A wealthy man displays a precious jewel. For a Jewish viewer, this would be a clear hint to the communitarian belonging of the portrayed man. If my interpretation is correct, the man portrayed in the painting, even if not Abraham Farisol, was a Jewish signore, one of the wealthy patrons of the beautiful manuscripts that were executed in the Ferraran environment, such as the Rothschild Miscellany. Jews in northern Italian cities were relatively well integrated in the local society. Farisol's life more or less overlaps that of another Ferraran outstanding author of the generation, one of the most illustrious poets in the history of Italian literature, Ludovico Ariosto. In Ariosto's comedies, describing the Ferraran society of his days, we find allusions to the local Jews. Although evidently written to entertain an aristocratic audience, Ariosto's comedies never employ vicious characterizations of their Jewish characters. Rather, all of them perfectly fit in the composite society of the relatively tolerant Este court of the early 16th century. For this reason, I hold that Ariosto's attitude towards Jews was nothing remarkable in contemporary Ferrara. He wrote his comedies for an audience who wanted a lively representation of daily life, not a theological debate. Indeed, Ariosto's writings never mentioned the complex intellectual discussions on both religious and scientific subjects that occurred when learned Christians encountered learned Jews in Renaissance Ferrara. I'm thinking, for instance, of the important theological disputation between Abraham Farisol and Pietro Palagiano from Trani. The debate took place at the court of Hercules I around 1487 and sparked even more polemics. Although there has been no study of Ariosto's direct relations with Jewish contemporary intellectuals, recent scholarship has investigated Ariosto's role in the literary education of late Renaissance Jews, and not just in Italy. Versions of Ariosto's renowned poem, Orlando Furioso, were produced in Hebrew and in other languages spoken by the European Jews. At the end of the 16th century, one of the most important Italian rabbis of the early modern era, Leone da Modena, translated two cantos of the Furioso into Hebrew. In the previous generation, another Leone, the Mantuan Leone de Sommi Porta Leone, based the play of his own on Ariosto's comedy, Lena. Leone's comedy, written in Hebrew, is titled Tzachot Bedikuta de Kiddushin. The title is an Aramaic formula, a stylish farce on engagement, and this was the first comedy written in Hebrew that made use of classical patterns. It was recently translated into English as a comedy of betrothal. The direct influence of Ariosto's Furioso on Jewish Renaissance culture is evident. No less significant is its indirect effect on literary models widely known in 16th century Jewish society. Jews in northern Italy, especially Ashkenazi Jews, adapted the popular chivalric genre to biblical narrative. We still have lengthy poems on the books of kings, and also a poetic version of the books of Samuel dating to the end of the 15th century. In the manner of the psalmist drama, these epic poems merged motifs from non-Jewish sources with rabbinic texts, which made them more authoritative within the Jewish communities. 
Elijah Levita, best known for his intellectual collaboration with non-Jews, adapted two Chivaldric stories, Wavo d'Antona and Paris and Vienna, into Yiddish. The first was titled Bovobuch and dates to the first decade of the 16th century, making it one of the oldest monuments of Yiddish literature. Against such a sociocultural background, we better understand the opening words of Farisol's treatise or Hotolam. And this is the first page, the opening page of uh, or Hotolam in the manuscript of the Philadelphia collection. Uh, in the opening page, the author warns the reader against the Meshalim, that is the fictional literature of Belletre, that he described as mainly consisting of, and I quote, love songs or historical books of ancient wars. Farisol certainly had in mind the kind of literature that was widespread in both Jewish and non-Jewish Northern Italian society in the 16th century and which was accessible both in Italian and in Hebrew and that the contemporary printing industry contributed to circulate. In the last years of his life, a man of knowledge such as Farisol, who was immersed in the most vibrant intellectual society of his days, certainly realized that the world that surrounded him was changing dramatically. The printing industry allowed wider audiences to be informed about subjects that were not part of the traditional education, and this aroused anxiety, all the more so within the Italian Jewish society. Since its inception, the printing industry was much cherished by Jewish scholars who cooperated with the most prestigious printers, be they Jewish or Christian. In Farisol's days, Venice was developing an impressive production of Hebrew printed books. And as we will see, it was also on the basis of recently published Venetian editions of travel accounts that Farisol could compose his geographic treatise or Hotolam. Moreover, Farisol's commentary on the biblical book of Job was printed in Venice by Daniel Bomberg in 1517 in the first Biblia Rabbinic edition. Like his mentor and teacher Judah Messer Leon, Farisol was lucky enough to see his manuscript production published in print while he was still alive. It is true that even in previous generations, Italian Jews had often taken advantage of the innovations that had reshaped Italian culture so deeply. Judah Messer Leon had been a pioneer in the field. In his itinerant yeshiva, Messer Leon had taught many Jewish students Aristotelian philosophy, rhetoric, and other topics that constituted the core of the Italian humanist curriculum. Messer Leon highlights the significant role played by the natural sciences in Jewish education in his masterwork, Sefer Nofet Sufim, the book of the Honecomb's flow. He states that after we have come to know all the sciences or some part of them, we study the words of the Torah. Then the eyes of our understanding open to the fact that the sciences are included in the Torah's words, and we wonder how we could have failed to realize this from the Torah itself to begin with. In other words, the receptivity of the Italian Jewish scholars was subject to the condition that the new literary and scientific attitudes be concordant with biblical and post-biblical traditional Jewish lore. Just as Messer Leon had rediscovered classical rhetoric in the Hebrew scripture, so Farisol wanted to match the interest of his contemporaries in geographic discoveries with the Jewish traditional interpretation of the Bible. It is in such vein that in the introduction to his geographic treatise, Farisol exclaims, try now to understand how much all the scholars, he refers evidently to non-Jewish scholars of his generation, lack the divine law, 
by noting the many places from which, when correctly interpreted, we may derive all possible information on the borders of hitherto unknown lands, on the people of those lands, and on the natural phenomena occurring in those same places, as it is evident from the book of Genesis, or information on the history of the generations of the people and their borders on their countries, as can be found in the book of Joshua. Certainly, the word of God has not been written in vain, but to let us know that all the inhabited worlds look like, as well as all the peculiarities of the wonders that God bestowed on his own creation. This is why modern readers should not be surprised by Farisol's descriptions of actual places and people, along with, I quote from his introduction, the river Sambathion and the Jews who lived beyond it, meaning he refers to the lost tribes of Israel, the boundaries of the land of Israel and the earthly garden of Eden. Farisol's first aim is that of drawing inspiration from the Bible as it appears from the choice of the title. Indeed, or Hotolam is a quotation from the book of Job, where the Hebrew phrase is endowed with a profoundly different meaning than what we would expect. In the standardized English version of the Bible, the verse reads, Will you keep to the old path that the wicked have trod? The Hotolam of Job are certainly not the ways of the new world or the new worlds, the itineraries a modern traveler should follow, nor are they the paths of wickedness as in Job, but are rather those of the valued tradition that should not be abandoned even in new worlds. This is a statement. Despite the major change produced by recent geographic discoveries, men should keep faithful to the word of the Lord. Farisol's treatise or Hotolam is evidently grounded in a long-lasting interest of the author in geography and the Bible. Already in his commentary on Job, Farisol had stressed the role of geographic descriptions. For instance, the author explains the location of the biblical land of Uts. Um, while in Mantua, in the environment of Judah Messer Leon, Farisol might have met for the first time Johannan Alemanno, another disciple of Messer Leon and another Jewish scholar whose family had moved in the 1430s from France to Italy. Like Alemanno, Farisol wandered around northern Italy, moving between Mantua, Ferrara, and Florence. About 20 years before Farisol composed his geographic treatise, Johannan Alemanno described in his Hebrew notebook some of the most important discoveries carried out recently by Portuguese and Spanish explorers. Alemanno did not make explicit mention of the American continent, although he wrote in a note, I have heard rumors about the discovery of new worlds. Alemanno added a date to the news, 1504, so he may well have had access to documents relating to the most recent maritime expeditions of the Florentine Amerigo Vespucci, whose letter on Atlantic explorations appeared in print exactly in 1504. Indeed, more than to the New World, Alemanno's interest was directed to travel accounts carrying messianic significance. Most of the information provided by Alemanno in his notebook relates to the reappearances of the lost Jewish tribes in India and Ethiopia and to the actual location of the kingdom of the mysterious Prester John, a Christian monarch said to be of Jewish origin. His rule was said to extend over a vast area located in India, although this geographic term actually defined the Indian subcontinent along with Southern Arabia and Ethiopia. The same topics were tackled by Abraham Farisol, who passionately deals in his geographic treatise with the same information on Jews in India and Ethiopia, the descendants of the ancient lost tribes of Israel, as well as with Prester John. Moreover, Farisol devotes a whole chapter, chapter 14th of his work, 
to the description of the messianic adventure of David Haribeni, the alleged son of a Jewish monarch from Arabia or Ethiopia who visited Italy in the early 1520s. The chapter opens with the explicit intervention of the author who stresses his personal involvement in Reubeni's messianic mission. To add value to this treatise that I composed in order to reveal the paths of the world to the ignorant, I, Abraham Farisol, decided to write about the roots of the Jewish man from the lost tribes, whose name is David ben Solomon, that we saw in our country, Italy. Despite Farisol's interest in traditional geographic literature on the lost tribes and Prester John's kingdom, attitudes to travel had changed in his times. Until the end of the 15th century, for most Europeans, travel meant pilgrimage to holy places, mostly. After the discovery of new regions of the earth, what is generally defined as the pious viator, the pious traveler model, turned into the more modern model of the studiosus explorator, the scholarly explorer, European readers became increasingly in, in concerned with the accounts of pioneering explorers of the remotest regions of Africa and less interested in the best routes to reach Jerusalem. Evidence of such change appears in Farisol's book, all the more so when we compare his work with Alemanus notes. Not surprisingly, Farisol uses the Hebrew word hoker, scholar, scientist, quite often, as well as cosmographus, cosmographia, from contemporary Latin, to describe his scientific attitude to the subject he's dealing with in his book. Like many of his cultured predecessors working in Italy, Farisol meant to collect scientific data and translate them into Hebrew in order to create a sort of compendium of material that was widely accessible in other languages. I wish to stress that Jews could read such literature in other languages, but Farisol wanted to build a Jewish intellectual legacy that asserted the Jewish identitarian belonging to the Renaissance culture. As the author maintains in his introduction, his book encompasses material drawn from personal readings and from conversations with contemporary Jews and non-Jews and especially merchants he had met in Ferrara. Now, let's take a quick look at the content of Farisol's work. As said, it was composed in the first part of uh, the Jewish year 5285, which corresponds to the end of 1524. In the first part of the book, Farisol mainly deals with the Ptolemaic cosmographical theory on which he intends to found his work. Farisol criticizes the traditional geographic attitudes that were being abandoned in his days. For Farisol, the geographer par excellence was still the second century of common era Alexandrian scientist Ptolemy. And here you have this marvelous geographic map uh, in, in, in the Laurentiana Library in Florence that depicts the world according to the Ptolemaic geography. Um, and at the beginning of the of Farisol's treatise, as a matter of fact, you have the enumeration of the three continents then known, Ethiopia, uh, sorry, Africa, Europe, and Asia. So the beginning of the, of the word is Farisol's word is based on Ptolemy. Although there is um, some criticism against Ptolemy because uh, Farisol is obliged to observe that the new continent that has been recently discovered was not known to such an authority as Ptolemy. 
And this is what he writes. It is real wonder that a new continent has been discovered, all the more so since the most illustrious scientist Ptolemy was totally unaware of its existence. As a matter of fact, he could not see it, and this is why he could not describe it. In this perspective, in my own view at least, Farisol's attitude is quite philological and reveals his profound adaptation to the humanist intellectual society of his own days. In the following chapters, after describing the various areas of the world and the various climates of the world, also on the basis of this very important bestseller, Giacomo Filippo Foresti's Supplementum Chronicarum, which was printed in Venice in 1503, and we have a map of the seven climates of the world, which is more or less the same um, as we find in, in Farisol's uh, description of those climates. After describing this, he turns to um, description of Africa and Europe, Christian Europe, what he called it, Christian Europe. And there he describes the new nav navigation routes opened by Portuguese and Spanish explorers, especially around Africa. He then highlights the importance of the new trading routes between Italy and Egypt and Italy and Flanders. A large section of Farisol's work is devoted to the various routes to reach the Eastern Mediterranean and the land of Israel. Mention is made of the main seaports along such routes. Chapter 10 is fully devoted to the actual boundaries of the land of Israel. Most of the following chapters deal with the new lands discovered by the Portuguese. In chapter 13, biblical sources are provided for the new lands discovered in Africa. Then Farisol relates the, the Insula Fortunate or Canary Islands in the Atlantic Ocean to the biblical Ophir. He thinks that the biblical fear is uh, where the, are the Canary Islands. This chapter, the 13th chapter, is a sort of introduction to the second part of the book, where the author will continually remind the reader that all the newly discovered lands were already described in the Bible, but he, his main source is what he calls it Libro de Mondo Novo in Italian, the book of the new world, and we will see what this book was. Um, I, I circle the Insula de Porto Santo here in this map because in chapter 16, Farisol writes that the king of Portugal sent many people to an island that he, call, he called Porto Santo. According to Farisol, those were Anusim, Jews who had been forced to convert at the time of the Iberian expulsion in 1492. From chapter 24 on, Farisol deals with Asia. He explains, for instance, that the Sabbatian or Sambatian river, the mythical Jewish river that would stop flowing on Sabbath, runs near the Ganges River in India, and, the subject he and on this subject he provides information drawn from the Talmud and Josephus. In chapter 25, Farisol explains that Prester John might live in that region. His source is again a book titled Mondo Novo, or New World. One of the most significant chapters for our talk is the fourth to last one, chapter 29, where Farisol reports on Christopher Columbus' discovery of the New World in 1492. It is now an established fact that the Spanish ships which were sent on an expedition by the King of Spain almost gave up hope of ever returning, but divine providence had decreed for them a kind of fate in that amid sea, those at the topmost mass discerned a strip of land when they had sailed along its shores and saw it exceedingly large size, they called it because of its great length and breadth the new world. The land is rich in natural resources. They have an abundance of fish, large forests teeming with large and small beasts of prey, and serpents as large as beams. The sand along the shores of the rivers contain pure gold, precious stones, and mother of pearl. And in the final chapter, the 30th chapter, Farisol enumerates the possible locations of the Garden of Eden. 
and eventually establishes its real actual location in the moon's mountains of Africa, that is, the mythical sources of the river Nile. A garret or hotlam is not a typical of the intellectual world of its time, deeply invested in new knowledge and yet filtering all of it through the lens of traditional knowledge, seeing new science contained in ancient texts and messianic fulfillment on exotic shores. Despite its many thematic interests and topics covered, the cosmological picture of the word in the Igeret or Chotolam is essentially based on that of Aristotle and Ptolemy. Farisol, as I've said before, often mentions an Italian book that is titled Mondo Novo or Mondo Nuovo or New World as his primary source, which helps him um, mostly to describe the customs of Oriental and African people. His source was a real bestseller, an Italian work that was titled Paesi Novamente Retrovati e Novo Mondo dal Berico Vespuccio Intitulato, which means newly discovered countries, a new world called after Alberico, that is Amerigo Vespucci. This was an Italian anthology of travel accounts, first published in Vicenza in 1507 by an Italian professor of sciences who worked in the Venetian area, Francesco Antonio or Fracanzo da Montalboddo. It was the first ever written anthology of travel accounts of the recent discoveries of Portuguese and Spanish navigators. The structure of Montalbodo's book is very similar to that of Farisol's or Hotolam, especially the second part. And the author quotes several times Italian words, the Italian words of Montalbodo's treatise. And uh, it's, there, there's many Italian loan words in Hebrew characters in Farisol's book. Farisol's treatise has the earliest known sketch of America in a Hebrew book. We can see this sketch in the Philadelphia manuscript on folio 32 verso. Uh, this, the drawing appears at the end of the 29th chapter, the one of the New World, and the comparison with Montalbado's treatise revealed that this was Farisol's primary source. Uh, this, in my opinion, is an interesting phenomenon of the use of printed material for the decoration of manuscripts. One would assume that it generally worked the other way around, that printers would draw upon manuscripts, stylistic patterns or contents for their publications. However, especially in the 16th century, when handwriting kept being popular in parallel with print, the two arts were interwoven and very much influential on each other. Let us look at the drawing of the stars in the southern hemisphere as it appears in the Schoenberg manuscript. The sketch illustrates the sky as it would have appeared to sailors navigating under the equator proceeding towards the coast of Brazil. I want to recall to your attention that here we are not dealing with Northern America. For them, Northern America didn't exist yet. We are dealing with Southern America because what the explorers were relating in their descriptions was the discovery of the coast of Brazil, okay? So, uh, the drawing of the stars in the Schoenberg manuscript, as you can see on, on the right side, is exactly corresponding to, corresponds exactly to the, to the print in Montalbado's text. And this is, in my opinion, very interesting because if we look again at the Philadelphia manuscript, on the same page we see on the left side the sketch of the stars. Hmm? If you want, I can tell you what the stars are, but I'll tell you later. <laughs> and on the right side, side, you see that there is a tri triangle 
you see there's a sort of triangle with an inscription inside, which according to some paleographists would have been added by Abraham Farisol himself. So this is very interesting because if this was true, if this is true, this is a further proof that the manuscript, this Philadelphia manuscript, is a very old witness of the Gerator Hot Palam and is a very precious testimony of this treatise. Uh, what is the, the caption included in the right, in the, in the, in the triangle on the right side? Um, here it is. So, um, you can, if you, if you can read Hebrew on the right side, it says, Surat Rabia Yabeshet Olam Chadash. Maybe. So, Surat Rabia can be understood as Surah, the form of a quarter of the continent, and then Olam Chadash, new world. Now, if we compare this sketch with the triangle that we find in, the Mont in Montalbado's work in the, in the following chapter than what we have seen before, the chapter of the stars, we have the similar triangle and the description, the caption of the triangle reads in Italian, forma della quarta parte della terra ritrovata which is exactly the same as in Hebrew. Forma, tsuha, shape, form, of the fourth part of the newly discovered land. So meaning that the new continent has this shape. See, it seems very odd because we would never think of Southern America as a triangle. Maybe we would think of Northern America as a triangle. But it's not so because if we compare to this very beautiful map which dates to 1520 and which was circulated in Ferrara in those days, um, this was a, a map of the known world by Pietro Coppo, a Venetian cartographer, we see that beyond the Atlantic Ocean there is the sort of triangular shape which is Brazil, okay? So it's exactly the same thing. So they were dealing with a sort of uh, strange geography. They didn't know exactly what they were dealing with. They were reading reports. They were reading letters, uh, descriptions. But they were interested, fascinated in that. So our manuscript, and here we come to the actual description of the manuscript. This is, again, the first page, the opening page of the manuscript, is what we, I'd like to call an inquarto size codex that contains 36 paper folios. It is written in an elegant Hebrew-Italian semi-cursive, we call it semi-cursive writing, that certainly can be dated to the first half of the 16th century. It shows extent, extensive marginalia, some sort of deco pen-made decoration in the margins of the first 12 folios. Unlike other copies of the Garrett or Hotulam, this one lacks any mention of its scribe, nor do we know in which year and city it was transcribed. However, since Farisol composed his work in 1524, and most of its dated copies were produced in the subsequent years, in, 20, in 1525 and 26 especially, we can maintain by comparison of this with the other witnesses that our manuscript too was executed around 1525-26. According to the final remark of the copist, it was composed under the supervision of Farisol himself, and the author was certainly still alive, of course, when the, inscription, when the transcription of the text was finished, as the formula next to his name reads, may his rock watch and protect him. 
From all this, we may assume that our manuscript was transcribed around 1525 or between 1525 and 1528, possibly the dates after which we don't have any longer references to Farisol, so we don't know if he was, was still alive after 1528. And possibly it was produced within the same scribal workshop that Farisol was running either in Ferrara or in Mantua. The first 34 folios of the manuscript contain the text of Egeret or Hotolam. And the very two last folios contain, although written in a different, slightly later Italian hand, an interesting Hebrew rhymed composition. It's just two folios. On the game of chess, the work of a medieval Spanish or Provencal author, we don't know, almost know nothing about him, uh, called Ibn Yahya Bonschner. About this work, which in all of its witnesses is entitled Mlitzat Zaha al Shok Hashak, a lovely poem on the game of chess, we know that we, it was popular in northern Italy, where many juridical shelot, or quesita, of the Renaissance era attest to the passion for this game among Italian Jews. It is generally assumed that this manuscript was transcribed by. Uh, Joseph Vinci de Lignago, so the catalog states. The place name should be corrected in Lignago, a city in northern Italy, very close to Verona. And the reason for such an identification should be related to the existence of at least two more manuscripts that contain Farisol's Igeret that were copied by the same Joseph Vinci. The two manuscripts, both of them extremely significant for the transmission of the Orchotolam, are Manuscript Budapest, Hungarian Academy of Sciences 333, and Manuscript Parma, Biblioteca Palatina number 2392. The Budapest manuscript was copied in Mantua by Joseph di Legnago, on the first day of the month of Marcheshvan of the year 286. And the manuscript Parma was copied, uh, we don't know where, by the same Joseph di Legnago, uh, on the 6th of Adar of the year 286. So both of them were copied in 1526, uh, at the end of, the, of let's say, Better. The first one at the end of 1525, the Budapest one, 1525, and the other one in 1520, at the beginning of 1526. However, the Italian semi cursive Hebrew writing of the Budapest manuscript is different than that of the Parma witness. The comparison of the writing of the Schomburg Codex with these two witnesses show a more distinct analogy with the Budapest manuscript it is then possible to maintain that the Philadelphia manuscript was actually copied by Finzi approximately around 1525-26. Besides the three mentioned manuscripts, there are at least four more witnesses of the Ochotolam. The manuscript Florence, Medicia Laurentiana, Pluto 247, whose 33 folios contain only Farisol's work, a manuscript in Oxford, a manuscript in Vienna, and a manuscript in Paris. The Florence manuscript that you see here, you see the opening page, has been credited for having been written by Farisol himself in a beautiful northern Italian Hebrew semicursive script. It could thus be a very old witness that has a peculiarity. In it, Orhotolam contains 31 chapters unlike our copy and most of those mentioned earlier that only have 30 chapters. The last chapter, the 31st chapters, is unachieved, so it might be exactly the copy which was produced under the supervision of Farisol or written by himself. Uh, 
the Oxford manuscript uh, in an Italian semi-cursive Hebrew script was the codex after which Thomas Hyde translated Farisol's treatise into Latin and published it in Oxford in 1691 with the Hebrew original facing his own excellent Latin version. And, is it, and you see it, it, it was translated as Itinera Mundi Cosmographia, Sig Dicta Nempe Cosmographia. The very interesting thing that I discovered while here was that um, Thomas Hyde, this very brilliant British Orientalist, published in Oxford in 1694 a Latin translation of the same treatise on chess which appears in the Philadelphia manuscript. Of course, he based, I immediately checked out in, 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 the, in the Bodleian Library and found out that he used a copy of the treatise on chess that is extant in the Bodleian Library. But still, it's very strange and significant that the same Orientalist did the two translations more or less in the same period. A short excerpt of Farisol's treatise is extant also in the miscellaneous manuscript New York Jewish Theological Seminary 2063, written in an Italian hand that can be dated to the second half of the 16th century or later. This codex contains, for the most part, Hebrew works originally produced in Italy, such as the Sefer Yosepon and other Midrashic anthologies that were popular in the peninsula. There are three more copies of our treatise extant in 18th century manuscripts, a partial one in Cincinnati and two in Moscow. The Schoenberg manuscript is thus one of the most ancient witnesses of Farisol's treatise and the only complete manuscript copy of the Gerrit or Chotolam that is preserved today in an American collection. For its supreme value in the history of Jewish science and for being the first work that deals with the discovery of America in Hebrew, this manuscript is of the highest importance. Moreover, its acquisition in the collections of the University of Pennsylvania highlights, along with other significant codices, the close links between Italian Judaism and America.